Okay, so this should look familiar, right? Uh, hopefully you've got some surfaces going on in all 20 of them. Um, and that is kind of what we're uh, going to assume going forward with this exercise. The point of this one is to get our topographic drawings out of those surfaces that you guys made last time. Um, so it should be relatively straightforward because you've already have the geometry and we're kind of just extracting data and formatting it. So it's not some huge undertaking. It's more about uh, precision and management than it is actual manipulation of geometry. It's actually just knowing uh, how to organize things and doing it things in the in the right order. If you're able to do that, it should be pretty straightforward. We've got um, I've got a Rhino template, and we'll make that available in the same folder as before. But it's basically the exact same thing as before, with just an additional guide for our drawing set on the right hand side. So if you've got your Rhino model from last time, and it looks like this area here, it's just a matter of um, having that and you can take this and export it as a separate Rhino file if you like from the template and import it right back into your existing model. Um, this is kind of a quick way to do it. You could also just take your surfaces and export them as a Rhino model and import it here. It's Since the labels are the same on both files, it'll drop stuff in at the right label and at the right position and all that other stuff. Um, so it's really quickly. Either way, you kind of just want to merge your data. Something we do a lot. That's why we're kind of really precise about our layer management because that lets us swap files really easily and not worry about things being in the right place because they started in the right place. Um, I, because it's a template, I don't have the, that geometry in there. I'm going to make a, a height field as an example, and I'm just going to uh, use that to, to pull off the drawings. I'm going to use a simple one. So I'm going to go, um, I'm going to start down here and just make one for this particular time. I'm going to use the same settings that we used last time. So I've got a single one, and maybe I'll do a couple bit, a couple more. So one one thing to kind of keep in mind on mine, I'm gonna I'm gonna do mine a little bit differently. This this particular um, template that I've got right now is is gonna is that I'm working with is in a different unit. It's in it's in inches. Um, the one that that's going out is going to be in feet, so you won't have to worry about the conversion. I just haven't changed it uh, back yet, so I'm going to change that to feet right now. So it's a good it's a good thing to look at. The geometry is always going to be the same, no matter what. Um, so it actually might be a good idea for us to leave it at inches when we bring it in and keep it. The reason I'll see that is because it's a little bit easier to understand the number for the contours. So because of that, um, when I use the height field, I'm going to just change one thing about it when I bring it in. So my sample points, they're able to stay the same because of the size of the units being the same, but I want to change my inches to be six inches instead of half a foot. So yours are already going to be the correct size and looking more like that, right? They kind of look like they have that six inch range that'll look pretty familiar to. So yours already look like that. Um, what I'm going to do is, if you were to bring those in, you would have to scale them possibly. Depends on which template that you work with. Um, bring it in there. But it'll be pretty evident if you need to scale anything. The way you would scale anything in Rhino uh, would be a universal scale. So if I had to make this item 12, if I had to convert this by a factor of 12, I would just use the transform scale 3D. I would have my origin be something that's already in the right place. So in this case, it's this corner here. And I always want to use a direct number, so my scale factor would be 12. And that would get to the proper size. And if it was too big, I would just do 1 over 12. But I'm never, I don't need to snap to things or anything like that because my size is kind of already established. It doesn't matter. There's always an absolute size to things. Um, so it doesn't matter if I bring this in. It's still going to be 30 by 22. It's not going to change sizes there's always an absolute size to geometry. So I'm going to make myself a copy of these for the sake of the, um, to get myself caught up to where you guys are. You won't need to do this. Mm -hmm. 
So now I've got, kind of like you do, yours are a lot more interesting because they're different, but I've got 20 surfaces. And the first thing that I want to do is I want to get them aligned to a proper uh, spot. Right now, they're depending on my individual image. If you take a look at it in an elevation view, like the front view, they're going to be all at kind of different heights, hovering um, above or below, um, depending on the setting. So you can see right near this one's kind of dipping below the uh, the C plane, which is my construction plane, that red line there. Um, most of them, I'll turn on shader for a view. Most of it's above, but it's not consistent, right? I want to make sure that this entire thing is above where I'm at. The quick way to do that is to select the objects that I made and align them. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to be in this front view. And this is something you'll have to do. It, it, I'm going to take um, everything. So I'm, I'm drawing a box from left to right that's a bounding box that's going to select both the surfaces and the curves, like that. And I'm going to use the align command in my front view. And that's under transform. Now, the align command is going to look at my current view. And it's going to ask me what kind of alignment I want to do. I'm going to align the bottom of everything. And that'll basically have everything called the bottom the bottom. And nothing will go below the bottom. So I'm going to click that option up there bottom and it's already doing that see this is my black preview you can see that it's if I zoom in it's already doing that for me the lowest low is right down there so it's already fixed my issue it just wants to know where I want to do it where to place it so I'm just gonna snap to my original spot that I had I've got an end snap there it's like one of the corners of the rectangles and I'm just gonna put it there and that's gonna make my adjustment so that now um, everything is kind of consistent and measuring off the ground. If we consider this like a sea level, right, then it's going to be consistent with that. Cool. Looks like I need to do something here along the same lines with this particular drawing, because I can do that now too. I'm going to go to my right view. And it works with any kind of any kind of geometry, so I'm going to go align it. In this case, bottom or top, if you're dealing with flat objects, work the same way. Okay. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create some contour lines. And the reason why we do this all together and we have everything aligned together um, is so that we only have to do it once. So although we have got 20 topographies, we're going to treat it as if we were treating one piece of geometry. We, knew, we never would do it 20 times unless there's a discrete reason to say step one's different than step two is step to step three. You never think that way. You always think in terms of automation. Um, I run it all the way through and do as few steps as possible. I'm going to create contours. So I'm going to go and run that command. It's under curve. I want to do curve uh, from objects and do a contour. It's going to ask me up top what objects that I want to contour. So it'll contour anything that I want. When we run the contour command, it's like running a series of parallel sections. When it hits a surface, it makes a curve. When it hits a curve, it makes a point. So we're going to contour just our surfaces. It has some other options here that are important. Assign layers. It wants to know where the new contour curves are going to go. Right now, they're going to go on my current layer, which is my topo lines layer. You want to make sure that's your active layer. Join curves. I'm going to join the curves by the contour plane. So the curves that are touching will get joined together as a single curve. And then when I'm asked to select contours of uh, my objects, I'm going to go to Edit, Select Objects, and Surfaces. Those are the only surfaces in my whole model. Your model is going to have surfaces and curves, if you did it right, on the same sublayer. So time one is going to have both a bracket and the surface. So if you just start slick, click, clicking on entire layers of objects, it's going to be really difficult to do it. The other way that you could do it is use filters up here in Rhino to turn off, to turn off things like curves and do selections up there. So if I wanted to do it that way, 
I could unclick this curves filter that's in Rhino, and the filter is available down the bottom right. Pulls up the filter manager. Now when I draw the box around things, it only selects surfaces because the filter for the curves is turned off. Either way, this is what I care about. You can see how 20 surfaces are added to the selection no matter how I do it. That's important. Sign layer by contour plane looks good. The next thing it's going to ask me is what's the base point? At this point, I want to create stacked contours, vertical contours. That's why I go in my front view and I'm drawing the per direction perpendicular. So I'm going to draw zero as my first. That's going to set me at the origin point and I want to go straight up. It's asking me my perpendicular to contour planes direction. I'm going to go straight up. I've got my ortho enabled, so then I'm going straight up. And the next thing it wants to know is what's the distance between my contours. My model's in inches, and I want to do a quarter of an inch, so I type in 0.25. So it's going to take a little longer than doing all surfaces because it's slicing contours through all 20 simultaneously. Six inches, right, quarter inch, about four per inch. So we should have about 24 layers of it. So when I take off my surfaces, and I'm just going to hide them for a second so you guys can take a look at what we actually have here. I'm contoured out. And this is my drawing that I'm going to use going forward with it. Right? You'll notice that there's, depending on, even if you run the contour command with a ton of geometry like we just did, you might get certain errors. One of these is sometimes if a contour might not slice all the way through a little part of a surface like this. This happens sometimes. You've got, you've got options for that. One option is to close the curve. It'll look at the natural curvature of a curve and close it. So if I select that curve and say close curve, it'll add a straight line and top it off. If I don't want it to add a straight line, I can run that command and start to look at um, other ways to do it. So other ways to do it would be to create another curve and join it together. I can also just simply delete it. I try to keep as much topography in there as I can, so something like simple like that. I don't have any real problem just using that straight closure to it. I'd rather have that piece of uh, information in my topography. But it's because we're slicing so much stuff that you're going to start to see that. You may or may not see it. I mean, it's, it's an inconsistent thing. It's because you're running so much, so it's an issue of memory and things like that. But for all intents and purposes, we've got the curves that we need here. And what, I'm, what we're going to talk about is the, what we talked about in the handout is, is the identification of uh, the peaks and the coals. That's something that can happen at multiple stages. You can do it here. You can do it after you scale it down. You can do it after it's an illustrator. It's a matter of preference. But what you do need to do for all these is identify where they are. And the method that we're doing that is by selecting the coals and peaks and separating them out from the crowd. So for instance, if this is my drawing, I've got several peaks that are going on and I'm gonna and I'm gonna identify them as such by trying to find them. The peaks are the easiest ones to find. They're always gonna be the smallest, right? They're your smallest kind of concentric set. So if I look at curves like this one and I'm holding down shift and I'm selecting a couple other ones as well. Once I can't get any smaller, I know this one, for example, has a lot of peaks on it. I did one earlier, and this one has even more peaks than the one earlier. So they're all going to be different in your number. I'm going to change the layer to peaks. So I'm going to right-click the peaks layer and say change object layer. It's not because I want them to be red. It's because I want them to be separated. And doing that lets me see that I've actually got an extra little curve here. 
right? Clean it up a little bit. That's going to run all the way through. Same idea, change object layer. Once I've run them all the way through, I'm going to look for the coals. So I'm changing my active layer down in the layer manager. The question is, is there a one-to-one -one relationship? Is there a coal for every peak? Yes? No. They can share a coal or no? Yeah, so they can. So some of these are going to share some, some of them aren't, and it's a, it's a matter of taking a taking a look at your at your actual one and trying to find out which ones are conjoined. So for these instances, the minute they go off to join another one, that's the calls of these two are those for sure, right? I've got. It's going to take practice. So, not all of them do, right? But we look at certain ones that are extremely steep, and there might not be a case in this one where I've got simply a shared coal going on. I've got one here that is operating for just this guy down here. It's the nearest one. But these have their own. This peak is associated with that one. This peak is associated with that one. So we've got multiple things happening at the same time, right? This is related to this one. This is related to this one. Some of those a little easier to track down. I'm starting to select and once I see it spread out to share another one right I know that it can't be that one it has to be this one does that make sense is that yeah yes no yeah yeah Mike we also talked about that the top view is one way of doing it if yeah. you have perspective view you can actually see it in three dimensions and you might be able to verify yeah that'll definitely help you out so if you go, if you go that route right, right. Like so if we start to look at what's happening here you start to see the lower points showing themselves, making a little bit more sense. So this starts to approximate that diagram that we looked at right here, where it's jumping off to the next one. So if I'm looking at this one, I'm starting to find the one that's starting to isolate my peaks. And one way to do it is to start general and start climbing up and finding out which one. So this wouldn't be one. I would definitely take the time and just close this one off since it's a topo line. No problem to just use the closed curve. It's not going to kill you. I want to isolate that as being one and that being one as well. This one I had already picked, right? You start to see these ridges occur. This is like your major approach that would happen on a summit. You see this kind of stuff happening all the time when two of them come together. This becomes typically the easiest thing to climb and also the windiest thing to climb. That's the, that's the trade off on, on, on stuff like that. But good point. We can verify that by looking at it. I think there's a little bit more intuition happening here. I think on here, when we look at it in plan, it's more based on a series of rules that we understand. So let's say that I'm done. I've ran them all and found them all, and I've done it for all of these. We could, do, we could do this now, that, that, that's when I chose to do it, but the point being is I'm going to take these and move them over to my drawing. I'm going to make a copy of them. I don't, um, I'm, not, I'm not terribly concerned. Um, I want to make sure that I've got everything selected when I bring it over and I can start to use things for matching, right? So these frames that exist are all on these layers, right? 
I'm going to use them as a reference, but I, I can first thing I can do is since these exist on my drawing is in my drawing layer, I can select subject object layers, select my sub object layers rather, and hold down control and deselect that. This is what's going to go over. I'm going to move it and then I'm going to scale it. So I'm moving things. I never tend to, I always use a, a clear reference. I don't tend to reference the object itself. In this case, I'm going to talk about the bottom left corner of my grid of drawings. So I'm going to do a copy, so transform copy. And I'm going to use my end snap to snap here. And I'm going to snap to the corresponding drawing there by left clicking. It's asking me to do more copies, but I don't need to, right? So I can just right click, which will get me out of the command. And now I've got everything lined up at that corner point there. If I type in SEL last, that's going to select the last created geometry that I just made, and I can scale it. So I do a transform scale, I'm scaling in three dimensions. And my origin point is always the, the thing that's already in the right spot. So in this course, it's that corner. And my scale factor or first reference point. I'm going to turn on my smart track. And I'm going to smart track to something that hits the, the edge or the corner of my or my boundary or the edge there. I could have also brought those other frames over. If you feel safer bringing those other rectangles over, you can do it and just get rid of the extra stuff later. It's just keeping it either one. The other thing I could do is type in the distance because I know how big this guy is supposed to be in the first place. This entire drawing, if I know that amount, I can type that amount in and I don't have to use references either. Any one of those ways to work. So I'm clicking here and then I'm just going to bring it in to the preset boundaries that are existing in my drawing, which is this corner right there. And I'm left clicking. Left clicking is always telling mo model space information. Right clicking is always saying OK or enter or something like that. So at that point, this is real scale. This is, this is a representation of your drawing. So it's scaled down and ready to go into Illustrator. Okay. So I'm going to take that and export it. It's only going to export the information that, that I select. So at that point, if I, would, if I had those extra little frames that I copied over, I could just like turn these layers off, right? And those color frames would go away if I brought them over. Otherwise, you can just bring in the black frames that were already there for you. They're under this layer called um, uh, borders. They're already there for you, so you can just bring those in. This is the important one is I want to bring this in because I've got the analog of that in Illustrator and that's how I'm going to line up my drawing in Illustrator. <coughs> so that's that's another important one that I want to bring in. You can see I'm going to export that. Uh, I'll just call it my uh, topo line drawing. And I'm going to export it as an Illustrator file. This is still three-dimensional geometry, but because I'm exporting it as an Illustrator, it's going to come in as flat. I could have run the make 2D command as well, but it, it's still going to give me the same exact drawing either way. So sometimes we do make 2D with projected drawings. In this case, it's a top-down drawing, and it's going to give us the same drawing. So it doesn't make a difference. It's just one extra step. This is asking me what scale. Since I've already scaled my drawing down to real life, I'm going to preserve the model scale and make sure one inch equals one inch. I'm going to use my color scheme to be CMYK. I'm not going to click any other options. I'm going to get feedback reminding me where it went. So I'm in the Illustrator. This file is already provided to me. Um, this file is talking about the same rectangle, and it has the labels for each individual one that I'm going to fill out. It's just a matter of bringing that information in. I'm going to open up that file that I just exported on my desktop. It's in there. Who knows where it is? I'm going to hit my, uh, my option zero to zoom out. And I'll hit my control 
actually it's control zero and then just do a couple of zoom out clicks. Because I moved stuff over, this is off to the side. Take a look at it. I can hit control A and select everything in Windows and bring it over for a minute. I'm not going to really do anything to the drawing. This is a the same drawing you can see in Illustrator if we look at the uh, layers that we've got. They're exactly that the, they, that they were in Rhino or Rhino. The difference is sub layers are named after their master layer. So instead of having a master layer and then a sub layer under it called borders, it's called drawing colon colon borders. It'll do that forever. So if I had a sub layer under borders, it would be called something else. It keeps them separate. Um, you've got on the template, you've got a layer called drawing, right? So if I do a new layer in my drawing out of Rhino called drawing, I can grab all that stuff and put it in this master layer here. And in Rhino or in Illustrator over on this side, I've got a layer that's called the same thing. So I check this option in the layer manager right here, this little tiny thing that gets to all the actually good things in there. And if I've got an option here called paste remembers layers, this is a big option that lets us drop things back across different files so that I have control over copy and paste and stuff into the right spot. So we want that checked. I go back in here. I click the circle for my master drawing layer. That ensures that I'm selecting everything. I want to make sure I'm picking everything, right? The other way to do that is the control A. Make sure I've got everything. I'm going to do a control C. I'm going to co copy to my clipboard and I'm going to control V paste it to my clipboard and it's going to drop stuff into the correct layer in Illustrator in my other drawing. So that's in the right spot. Yeah? So take the extra time, work systematically, save yourself that extra time, and then use it to go trick-or-treating is what I would do. I wouldn't spend more time on this than necessary. If I align the corners up and I use my friends, the smart guides, to do it, things should be pretty set up already. So all I've done is I've taken a look at the existing artboard and I've taken everything. It's easier to grab everything now because I put it in a master layer so I hit that circle and um, move it as one object. The best way to do that is to select the boundary, right? And I've got for you a uh, crop lines kind of layer that has a line around it already that we're going to print so that you can crop your drawing to the correct size. So when I select everything on this drawing layer, it's, a, some, it's also additional geometry that I can start to snap to over to it, right? It's yeah, <laughs> he saw his own, he saw his own doppelganger and he's scared. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm okay, so it's in the proper place. I want to leave the, the placement alone at that point, it's already set up. What do we do? We, we, we actually start to manage the line weights. It's coming in by default. Things are going to come into Rhino uh, or from Rhino into Illustrator. They're going to come in the layer that, that they were in with the color that it was in Rhino, right? So if I was really picky and I didn't want the green red, I could have changed it to black before I exported it. There's that layer. but. I've still got to adjust the line weights in Illustrator no matter what, so it doesn't save me that much trouble. It's a lot easier to um, work with line weights in Illustrator by layer, not going and picking individual objects. That's a really slow way to do it. That's why we keep everything organized. So now when I go into my drawing, there's a set, there's a layer order, right, that I use. We want to leave our borders alone. Um, the drawing, um, I believe I, we had our drawing borders. We're going to set those at 0.5 strokes. So I'm, when I hit this circle, that selects all my drawing borders. It's black. Came in as black. I'm going to leave it as black, but I'm going to change it to be a 0.5. And I've got that up there. I can add that to the instructions. So there's this instructions layer that's been added and that has the line weights on it. So I'll call my borders point five point 
stroke. Those are done. Moving on. Um, the drawing extends, I don't have to worry about that. That's that black boundary around everything. I can turn that layer off. The coal layers, I'm going to select everything that's on there. So this is why I kind of encourage you to do it in Rhino, because now you don't have to go hunt them down. You can just select them all by one layer and change their line weights. If you wanted to change the layers, you could do it here for sure, but you're going to have to go into the drawing topo line layers and start selecting them. That's really sloppy because now you've got to go find it and drag it. I hate that. Don't do that. You can do it. I would say don't do it. Um, but it is possible. If you're, and some people that might be ultra comfortable with Illustrator and freaked out by Rhino might want to do it that way. Okay, that's fine. But I think it's quicker to do it in Rhino for you. I'm going to select the, um, I'm in there, I'm going to select the, the, the Coles layer. Actually, let me do my peaks first. They're a little bit simpler. The peaks, well, let me do the topo lines. They're the simplest. The topo lines are all going to be 0.25. That's the top section there. They're going to be lighter because there's so many of them. We can't have them blending together. So they're going to be an ultra light line weight. That Those are there. My peaks, I'm going to change that. So they're red now because that's where they were in Rhino. So I'm going to go down to my print swatch, which will be part of the template. It'll already be available in the template. The print swatch, that's a basic swatch, right? I just changed the colors. They, um, those things were already one stroke, one point stroke, so I just changed the color on it. The coals that we're doing are the one that's a little bit more advanced, and those are going to be done by looking at the actual stroke menu themselves. So if you, the first time you open the stroke menu, the options might not be visible on your Illustrator. This is again where you want to get to that little menu that has the important stuff on it. So if I go down there, it's going to say show options. And that's where I can control whether these are dashed or not. So the first thing I'm going to do is make them black. So all the line work for our drawings is going to be black. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to be 0.5. And then I'm going to make it a dashed one in the options there. So to control dashes, you've got two things. You've got the dash itself and the gap. Um, our dash is going to be 0.5. When you do a dash value that's the same as the stroke value, it basically makes it more like a dot than a dash. But we are going to spread out the gap a little bit, so it's going to be a two-point gap. And make sure you're doing this with that everything in that layer is selected by hitting this circle here. So now when I zoom out, my line work's applied to the drawing and all the drawings because of the, because of the layer uh, sent, will be sent on and already, right? So if I'm doing it correctly, I can do this without seeing it because I've organized things correctly and I've kept things maintain, uh, maintained. I know that things are on the right layer. I know that my stuff is looking the way that it should be, right? So after that, it's just a matter of getting it out. Once you adjust all your line weights, you want to go and just make sure you put in the info that's not available, right? Since there's no one that's named first name, last name, we need to know who you are. <laughs> there's always going to be one person that don't forgot don't this. Don't yeah, be, uh, don't be that guy or gal. Somebody will be that guy or gal, just make sure it's not you, but it always happens. And right, this is the this is a real tough test, but you will have to delete the other three instructors' names. I'm my own instructor, so I'm gonna delete those guys out and say that. We've put the positions in there. This is the same grid you guys have done with your photos. You will have to tell us what time the photos are though. So when I look in here. The other thing I need to do, maybe I look at one of these. If let's say that this one was done already, is I do have to count the peaks. Yeah, this is something I could do um, in Rhino. Hint, hint. If I really wanted to, I could do it ahead of time. How could I do that? Well, I could select my peaks by right-clicking, select objects right and if I had other ones I would hold down control and deselect my other drawings right there and what would that tell me 
<coughs> that would tell me how many peaks I have because that's how many circles are on that layer. So if I say select objects and, do, and hold down control and deselect anything else like that, I've got 52 curves added to that selection. The problem with that is I've got too many. So that's probably because some of these are broken up. So I would have to join them up to do that. So sometimes my shortcuts work, other times they don't. This is what happens when you don't rehearse. But if you want, if you're, if you're help, one thing that would help you is if you have trouble keeping track of stuff, is you could just use the annotation dot. Um, that's um, under um, dimension and you've got an annotation dot and what you can do is you can just start numbering them and putting the annotation dots down. And those don't print. And those don't print. So I can just not select those out and they won't come out, they won't export into my Illustrator file. Still. So all I'm doing is I'm hitting the space bar that repeats the previous command and I just type the number in. And that way I'm not, I'm, I'm a little bit more systematic about doing that. The other thing that you can do is when you ever do a command in Rhino is you can hit shift eight and put a star in front of it. And that's an auto repeat option that basically runs the command the minute you finish it. So I, if I dot this, it just runs the command again without me having to rerun the command. So if I've got 500 peaks, that's 500 less times I've had to hit the space bar. So it doesn't seem like a lot once, but it's exponential. You can also type in repeat. And it'll ask you the command to repeat, and then I can type in dot. What well, was it just to the star? Yep, the shortcut is to put the little star in front of the command. You can also type in repeat. And it'll ask you what command to repeat, and then you can run the command. And it'll keep repeating until you hit escape. So I'm back in Illustrator. I've got a lovely drawing going here. I've used military time to placate my level coordinator who's European in nature and I say at 1500 o'clock well that's my last time right and is it an isotropic that's the tough one that's the subjective area where I've got to decide does it flow left or right is it is this one like kind of even in both ways homogeneous how's this thing spread out that's going to be your call. So I, you know, I stepped out when, when Philip was talking about that. But the peaks are easy, right? We want a lot of peaks. The question is, is it anisotropic or not? Is it going to work for us? Does it lend itself from going along the long axis? Or is it actually something that works better along the other axis? You've got to answer that. But again, this is not the answer. Yes, no, maybe is not the answer. You've got to pick one or the other and delete the other one. So, so once this is done, You're going to save it as a PDF. And one thing I kind of encourage you to do is save a copy so that this stays an Illustrator file and the PDF is a separate file from it so you don't mistakenly flatten it or something like that. I'm going to put this in my desktop as a PDF. and make my file smaller, I'm going to get rid of anything that lets me edit it still. I don't need layers. I don't need any of that stuff. Maybe I want to view it. Don't need that. Cut the fat. Have the smallest one possible. I don't want to need to illustrate this PDF. I don't need the line work anymore. I want something like that is what I want. And that's ready to print. I left this layer on up here for cropping. So you can't see it probably that well, but there's a little dashed line out there. So when you send it to get print, you tell them to do it at 100% so you can crop it there and it doesn't get squished down. And anything I missed on that or anything I'm missing any info? Good? Cool. All right. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah? Yeah. Like they were the bottom, like the flat 
Mm. Peaks. That's why we're using the perspective view for confirmation. Okay. Yeah. So the, so the bottom points would be considered peaks as well, right? No. We're talking about the peaks. Cool. Yeah. Like those those be, those are their own entities. Yeah. Let's look at an example. Yeah. So if I let's start from this one. Let's do like this guy over here. So I would I grab those and plan real fast. But if I had taken this as a three-dimensional one, we want we wanted to know the peaks because where the peaks aren't is going to help us as well when you guys decide about the the transversal. So that's a really good point. I did it really quickly. Um, I would I would confirm like here. So it might be a, a quicker way to grab the peaks would it, would would be to start from looking at it in, in a kind of more three-dimensional nature. The other way to do it is to do what I did, um, do it quickly in plan. And then just go do your selection and plan, and then just take a look at it in elevation, and deselect the ones that aren't the peaks. Another way to do it, or to do that in perspective as well, is to just take a look at and deselect the ones that are low. So in this case, I could deselect those. Um, it's tougher to do in elevation because everything's kind of aligned. I think it's, it might be the most intuitive is just grab the peaks. I think once the peaks are done, though, they kind of set the, the they set the tone because then you're just relating each one to a cow, right? So you'll you won't that way you won't kind of mistakenly do it. So that's a good that's a good point. I, I think it might be easier to grab guys like this right in the perspective mode and start to assign those to it. Cool. So I could take these and change the object layer. I can always go back with my objects in a put the object layer back to where it was. And the ones that are right like that. Any other questions? What if that below This one? No, no. Uh, leave your pasta in the spot so I can direct. Not interested. The ah. point is, I'm not going to go through one of these. The point is that you understand that concept of it, right? If you understand that this is a peak, I think this is a this is a kind of indicative one. The, this yeah. these three here. See, but, then, like it's it's this thing, the saddle. Yeah. If we understand that. That this is a peak, this is one, this is one, and that the associated cow for this one, these are separate and not the same. When would they be the same? Well, in the absence of these two different layers of topography, so if I didn't have this information and I didn't have these two here, and if this was a steeper thing, then we'd have a shared single call that would happen right there. That will, you guys will have ones like that that share on there. So kind of keep that in mind. And some of them will be a lot larger than that, too. Yeah. It all depends, right? If we've got somebody with a lot of high contrast, you're going to have a lot of peaks and a lot of cows. You got somebody with a flatter topography, there's going to be a lot of sharing, and it's going to be, it's going to look a lot of different than this one that was pretty high contrast. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to hit the old stop button on that one then.